gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jaivant Kaur Rangi. Uh, Dr. Rangi is uh, a diabetologist and endocrinologist in currently in practice, and um, she is a renowned uh, doctor. You can read her biography in the program. Um, and without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Rangi. Thank you, Dr. Anand. Good morning, everybody. I'm honored to be here. I'm grateful to Seek Foundation for inviting me. And I'm very happy to speak in front of such an accomplished audience. I had an opportunity to meet some of you outside, but not everybody. And I believe some of you had this concept that probably I'm talking about medicine today. And unfortunately, I'm not. I was asked to speak about growing up as a Sikh, what my challenges were, and what brought me to where I am today. So please give me 15 minutes to share my journey. And I'll be very happy to talk about any concerns or questions about specifically about endocrinology or diabetes outside once the conference is all done. I have all day today, I'm not in any rush. So if anybody has any questions about hormones or diabetes or endocrinology, I'll be more than happy to meet you. So health is a true wealth, my journey. We're gonna talk about three stories of three young people in India. One is a little boy who's sick all the time. He fails to thrive and cannot play and ride bikes like his cousins. Even at age 21, he still looks like a little boy. He cannot grow a beard. His health is a true concern. Do you all agree with me? Yes. The second child is a little girl. When she is just an infant, her father dies, fighting a war while serving in Indian Army. She and her sister are raised by a single mother. Some 13 years later, they face an angry mob of neighbors who have turned on them because they are a minority. The third child is the only son in a family. He suffers with diabetes to a point of blindness in one eye and almost loss of vision in the other. But he earns his living as a taxi driver. So he needs his eyes. He supports his family, his elder mother, widowed sister and children. All these stories are real. They're all connected. They may look like tragedies, but they all benefited from education in a very different way. So please share the first story. The first story is about my cousin. That's him when he was 18. As a kid, he failed to thrive. He couldn't play ride bikes with his cousins. And like I said, even when he turned 21, he did not grow beard. We were truly concerned about his health. I was bothered for years about what was wrong with him. I wanted to know how we could find out. I wanted my uncle to find the doctors who could give us an answer. In India, this was not a simple course. We lived in a small town in Rajasthan called Pilani. How many of you know Pilani? Nice. That makes me happy. So I grew up in Pilani. That's Pilani, yes. But that's far from sophisticated doctors. It's a small town. It's like an oasis in the desert. Seven hours drive from Delhi and Jaipur drive. No airport, no train station. The nearest train station was an hour and a half away. 
Eventually, the doctors in Delhi diagnosed him with a condition called pan hypopituitarism. It's a condition that I deal with every day now, and I'm very familiar with it. The name sounds very fancy and difficult to say. It's very simple. There's a gland in our brain right here behind the eyes called pituitary gland. All heard about it? If not, let today be the first day. Tiny gland pituitary right behind your eyes. It's got very important function. It controls all the hormones in the body. And my cousin was probably born with it, or he had a problem as he grew up. What exactly was a problem, we don't know, but the end result was his pituitary was not able to work. And the diagnosis was key to his treatment. So we were very relieved and happy once we found out what he has. He got started on hormone replacement therapy, and he's doing excellent. He grew up like everybody else. He matched his peers. But the point here is there could be something somebody could be living with that could take a long time, sometimes decades, to be diagnosed. Not that they are very sick from it, but it could be subtle problems. So as a human being, as a citizen, as a friend and a neighbor or yourself, make sure you watch out for those little things because you may be able to help somebody by alarmed, um, you know, their outlook or how they're growing up. So that was my first story. Now the doctors who diagnosed him were endocrinologists. So that was definitely a reason what drove me to what I am today. The second child that I mentioned was myself. I was the youngest of the three children. My father served in Indian Army and was away in Rajori sector in Kashmir in 1971 war while I, when I was born. I never saw him. He prepared this letter And of course, one of his wishes was I should be a doctor. My m mother, who's barely high school graduate, did everything she could to educate us. She did all in her power to fulfill my father's wishes for us. My mother, my sister, who's joined me today, and I, we moved to Rajasthan. And that's where we did our education, our schooling. And my brother was raised by my dad's elder brother. So that's when Pilani came in town, in picture. And that's Pilani. If you've ever been to there, uh, this is Bits Pilani. That's world famous. At school, I received the formal education. I was blessed to be able to ride my bike to all-girls school and got the best education. And even though we were the only Sikh family in 25 mile radius, my mother ensured that we have good Sikh education at home. After school, she read us Sikh stories, religious stories to myself and my sister. She really modeled the behaviors of humility, service, tolerance, and acceptance that I use every day in my life now. And then came 1984. And that is not a new news for anyone of you. You know about the episode very clearly. I was only 13 then. And the same Indian army that my father fought for attacked Golden Temple, the holiest site for Sikhs. The country erupted with violence against Sikhs. Even in our small town in Pilani, a mob formed. People who had been our neighbors and friends 
suddenly saw us as enemies. I remember the horrible noise of hundreds of people banging outside. Terrified, we ran outside. My mom did not have her dupatta. We moved in our friend's neighbor's house where we stayed silent for hours and hours. The mob soon moved there, but later dispersed. We were lucky to have another friend who took us away. It was clear we could not ride the bikes to school again. It was that point when my mother put us in a boarding school. I still consider myself as very lucky, including myself, my sister, my mom. We came out of all this without any scratch. Just emotional trauma, and yes, loss of faith and loss of trust on our neighbors. During the Sikh genocide in 1984, more than thousands of Sikhs were killed, raped, murdered, it's even hard to speak those words. Forget about live with those. No parent wants their children to learn the lessons of violence and hatred. My mother had worked so hard to ensure our education, both formal and religious. Somehow, I'm not sure how, she helped us learn from this cruel school of sectarian violence as well. We learned. Life is precious and uncertain. So we need to live our life to the fullest and celebrate every day. Don't wait for that right moment to come to hug somebody. Don't wait for the right moment to say sorry to somebody. Just cherish every day with your family and friends and neighbors. We as Sikhs need to share our culture and beliefs with our neighbors and society. After about a decade, I had a professional and financial ability to return back to India to be of service. At that point, I met this third young man in my story. I offered to see patients in Gurdwara dispensary in Chandigarh at my father-in-law's request. After seeing hundreds of patients one day, I was ready for a break. And I walked out just to see a big line of people waiting just to see me. And of course, I didn't want to leave. Among them was a young man with type 1 diabetes, Rajwinder. Now, how many of you know type 1 diabetes? OK, so let me educate you a little bit about type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is when our pancreas, which are right here behind the stomach, it gets hurt from whatever reason. It stops producing insulin. Now, insulin is very important to our bodies. Insulin helps us process sugar or whatever you eat to process in your body. So there's clearly type 1 diabetes where you have no control, either some environmental factor, some infection, or things that we don't know cause damage to the pancreas. The second one is type 2 diabetes, which is more prevalent and common and that you all probably know about. And that's the one where it's more related to our lifestyle and genetics. Okay, so to cut it short, I know we are short on time. Rajwinder had type 1 diabetes that he got when he was 13 years old. His mother was very angry at him. She thought he was abusing drugs. 
Ignorance can be huge. But probably mom knew that that was the best thing she knew because she was worried about him. He lost 25 pounds. He was going to the bathroom all the time. The typical signs and symptoms of type 1 diabetes. Weight loss, unknowingly, significant. Too much thirst, too much urination, and too much hunger. Okay? So in case you have any family member, kids, neighbors around, watch out. Anyhow, he got diagnosed. I'm glad he got, he was lucky to get diagnosed because there are a lot of people in India who don't even make it to the diagnosis and they die. Like I told you, he was blind in one eye and had a poor vision in the other. He told me cheerfully that he waited only for two hours to see me. I was sad because I thought I'm stopping him from getting on to his job because he had to drive taxi to Mumbai pretty soon to take somebody. But he was very thankful because he said, on my routine visits to see my regular doctor, sometimes I wait all day just to turn away from PGI because there are so many people in line. And he loses whole days of income and, of course, the fact that he's staying there. I was astonished to learn that he had no glucometer. He had no way to check his blood sugars. Something that I tell all my patients to check three or four times and sometimes six to eight times a day with type 1 diabetes. And he did not have the means to do it either. And the syringe with which he was taking insulin, insulin is only given as injectable. It's not taken as a pill because your gut enzymes can denature it. So the insulin that he was taking, he was reusing the syringe for a month. Something that here I would use only once. One time use was used 60 to 80 times a day, uh, a month. Anyhow, after I learned his story, it was very moving. A lot of questions came to my mind. Just thinking if he cannot even check his blood sugar, how does he monitor his insulin? How, much, how does he know how much to take? So that means he was just doing it blindly, not knowing what he's supposed to do, not educated about it. It also made me worried about complications of diabetes. Now regardless of diabetes, whether it's type 1 or type 2, if it's not controlled, it hurts your body. It hurts the small blood vessels, it hurts the big blood vessels, and it can give you blindness, kidney failure, stroke, heart attacks. Okay? So already he had started showing the signs of affecting his body. He was blind, legally blind in one eye and almost the other, let alone his heart and brain. Now, teary-eyed, I gave Rajvinder a hug first and then gave him a brand new glucometer. I took some from here. And I gave him some testing supplies and some free insulin, which probably lasted him only for a month. Insulin needs to be stored on ice. It, I mean, not ice, but yes, on, uh, in the refrigerator. So you cannot carry as much. I returned to California and sent some more supplies with my father-in-law. But by the time he went to see him, he was not there anymore. I often think about him and wonder how he's doing. Is he still alive? Is he still driving? How can he support his family? Now, I may have helped Rajivinder likely. The best medicine I gave him was hope maybe for a month. But he gave me a lot more. Hmm. Okay, I missed that slide. He, represent, he represented the fulfillment in my father's wishes that I should be a doctor. He represented the fulfillment in my mother's teachings that I should be humble and serve others. He represented the fulfillment of a dream that because of my education and because of the opportunities I was given, I could be useful in a space, in a place that was deeply needed. So those were my three stories, and I'm almost running out of time. Three potential tragic stories benefited from education. This is me today. I'm lucky to be in this country. I went to medical school in Lady Harding Medical College in Delhi and thereafter Wayne State University, Detroit to finish 
my residency and fellowship. And today, I'm the only endocrinologist in three counties. I have an opportunity to touch many lives. I travel all across US speaking and educating doctors and others in my specialty about the new drugs and the new um, advancements in my field. I feel blessed to have that. Now in conclusion, my wish for all of you is to take advantage of the endless opportunities for education in this country and that you use what you learn in turn and turn the potential tragedies around you into your own stories of hope and abundance. Thank you.